So all the circuits that we've seen in the last few videos are what you would refer to as combinational circuits. So in a combinational circuit, the output is only a function of the inputs. We are now going to start discussing sequential circuits where the outputs are a function of the inputs as well as some internal state that the logic has. Now, before I actually get into sequential circuits, I need to first explain the notion of a clock and what role it plays in a microprocessor system. And then we can start discussing the sequential circuits and how the state gets updated. Now, you've already been aware of clocks. This is something that we discussed in the very first few videos where we talked about the clock speed of a microprocessor and we talked about IPC and so on. So let me just recap some of that information and then we'll kind of talk about the relevance of that in terms of microprocessor design. So one of the main reasons that we have a clock in a microprocessor is because it makes it much easier for me to coordinate all the tasks that are being performed in parallel on the chip, right? So the microprocessor chip may be composed of a whole bunch of different circuit blocks, right? So adders, register files, and decoders, and so on. And each one of these logic blocks is going to take a different amount of time to complete its work. And there's a very small probability that every single logic block is going to finish in the same amount of time. So if you start an instruction and it just simply flows from one logic block to the next, it is relatively hard to coordinate all of these tasks, right? Because if each block takes a different amount of time, one block may be feeding results to the next block even though it has not finished its previous operation. So in general, a clock is used to coordinate the actions of each one of these logic blocks. So what is typically done is that every single logic block receives a clock that is nothing but a square waveform that is shown over here, right? So you go into a period of high voltage and then a period of low voltage zero and back and forth. And every time you see a rising clock edge over here, every logic block says, okay, this is my chance to get started on my task, right? So I'm going to look at my inputs, I'm going to start doing all of my arithmetic operations or, or logical operations on those inputs. And I will make sure that I produce my result and get done before the next rising edge, right? So I have this amount of time to finish all of my work. And then in the next rising edge, I'm going to look at my next set of inputs, start operating on those. And then again, I have the same amount of time to finish my task. And then I move on to the next task and so on. And so if everybody is synchronous, that is if everybody is seeing the same clock and everybody has the same start and stop signal, it makes it much more easy and much more efficient to pass values from one logic block to the next, right? So that's the main reason that we have clocks in microprocessor systems. And you know this is this is vital knowledge before we start discussing sequential circuits, because I kind of have to know at what point I need to finish my task and update my own state. Once I've done that, I can move on to the next cycle. Okay, so that's the reason why clocks are essential in microprocessors and why clocks are essential to understand before we start discussing sequential circuits. Okay, so we've already seen this before, where the cycle time for a clock is defined as the gap between say two rising edges and the inverse of the cycle time gives me my clock speed. Now let me also expand on this notion of how values flow from one logic block to the next. Right? So we said that I have roughly one clock cycle to finish my task and then I move on to the next set of inputs and my results move on to the next stage. Now all of that is facilitated with a circuit that is referred to as a latch. Sometimes you may also use a flip-flop and in the next set of videos, I'll talk about the differences between a latch and a flip-flop. But for now, you know, I'm just going to use the term latch because it is less unwieldy. So what I've done is between every combinational circuit or even a sequential circuit, so this doesn't have to be combinational, so between every two logic blocks, I'm going to introduce a latch. This latch is going to have the property where at the starting of a clock cycle, it's going to record certain values, right? So it gets an input over here. When it sees a rising clock edge, it's going to record those inputs. So the inputs that are coming from the previous stage, let's say, could be the number five and the number seven. When this latch sees the rising clock edge, it records these values in its internal state. So it records the values five and seven. And now those values are going to stay stable for at least one clock cycle. So the clock has gone up, 
it's going to stay up going to go down after a while then go back down again during this entire time period this latch is going to remember its previous inputs which were 5 and 7 and those inputs are not going to change so as a result the inputs to this combinational circuit are going to be 5 and 7 for an entire cycle and they will never change so there'll be a bunch of you know logic gates over here that this circuit is navigating and once you navigate all of those gates you produce a result over here right so let's say this was an adder where I added the result of 5 plus 7 after going through the necessary gates I produce the result 12 and I was able to produce those results before the next rising edge right so I was given one clock cycle to do this task and let's say that I produce a result at time over here so before my deadline I was able to produce a result now at the next rising clock edge a value 12 is being provided as input to the next latch and so when it gets the rising clock edge it's going to record the result and say I just saw the number 12 being produced by the previous stage now that I've seen a rising clock edge I'm going to store that result and this is going to be a stable input to my next stage okay in the meantime when this rising clock edge is seen the previous stage may have produced a different set of inputs it may have produced inputs 8 and 6 so when when this latch over here sees this next rising clock edge it records its new inputs and it says I'm just seeing the values 8 and 6 and I'm going to record that and keep that as a stable input to my next stage for the next entire cycle right so in this next cycle over here the adder is going to perform addition on 8 and 6 because that's the stable input that it sees for that entire clock cycle it produces a result 14 at this time over here and then at this next rising clock edge this latch is going to record the value 14 and that then moves on as input to the next stage right so you can see that each one of these circuits is doing a certain task the task begins when it sees a stable input at the start of a clock cycle and that stable input kind of is persistent for an entire clock cycle I do all of my logical operations and I produce a result and then at the next clock cycle my result gets stored at the next latch and in the meantime my previous latch has recorded new inputs at that rising clock edge and that's going to be my stable input for the next one cycle